حضورنا الكريم يعد مؤتمر البرمجيات الحرة ومفتوحة المصدر فرصة لاكتشاف آفاق جديدة ومناقشة وتبادل الأفكار والخبرات والمعارف في هذا المجال كما يمكن المشاركين من الالتقاء والتواصل مع شريحة واسعة من مستخدمي ومطوري البرمجيات الحرة ومفتوحة المصدر إضافة للاستفادة من المحاضرات القيمة ومناقشة فرص إقامة مشاريع مستقبلية مشتركة في هذا المجال Dear ladies and gentlemen, free and open source software conference is a great opportunity to discover and explore new horizons of knowledge and to exchange thoughts and experiences. والآن ندعو الفاضل الأستاذ الدكتور براين فيتزجيرالد ليلقاء كلمة حول موضوع المؤتمر. للإشارة فإن الأستاذ الدكتور يشغل منصب كبير الباحثين في مركز أبحاث البرمجيات الإيرلندية ورئيس الابتكار في الأعمال والتكنولوجيا في جامعة ليمرك الإيرلندية عمل في صناعة البرمجيات لنحو 12 عاما له عدة مؤلفات منها 14 كتابا وأكثر من 150 مقالا في المجالات والمؤتمرات الدولية الرائدة في كل من مجالات نظم المعلومات وهندسة البرمجيات وغيرها فليتفضل مشكورا On this occasion, we would like to invite our guest for today, Professor Brian Fitzgerald. It was mentioning that Prof. Brian Fitzgerald is a chief scientist at LERO, the Irish Software Research Center. He also holds an endowed professorship, and his publications include 14 books and offer 150 peer-reviewed articles in the leading international journals and conferences in both the information systems and the software engineering fields. And before taking up his academic position, he worked in the software industry for about 12 years. Professor O'Brien, the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to... Um, to address you at this conference. Uh, I think Professor Hodge and his colleagues have organized a really exciting program and wonderful array of visiting speakers. Uh, I'm just, oh yeah, okay. So uh, I'm betting that um, not many people in this room have heard of Newpedia. So Newpedia was the first venture by Jimmy Wales and Larry Sanger into a, an online encyclopedia. And obviously in an online encyclopedia, uh, content is really important and the validity of the content. Uh, and the process was a seven stage process for having content admitted to Newpedia. And the result was uh, after three years, 25 articles. So 25 articles is not an online encyclopedia. Uh, but at this stage they'd heard of WikiWikiWeb, Ward Cunningham's idea of a quick open process. And th the title of my talk is The Power of Open. So. Uh, I've been involved in open source software for almost 20 years now, since it was coined in 1998. Uh, really exciting to see how d disruptive that has been, not just in the software industry, but in society in general. The power of open, how much it's done. So by moving to an open process, uh, it became Wikipedia. And, and the idea was you could, everyone could contribute and you can sort out the quality of the content later, but within one year it was 25,000 articles, so clearly the open process worked. Uh, and I think Wikipedia now is 41 million uh, pages, I think the seventh most visited website in the world, so it's a huge success story, but it's the power of open that led to that. Without an open process, it wouldn't have happened. Uh, when I started off, in the software industry back in the 1980s, IBM were the kingpins. So there was a saying in industry, no one ever got fired for buying IBM. So it was a pretty safe bet. Uh, IBM were very dominant in the technology marketplace. And then along came a newcomer, Microsoft, who, and Microsoft understood the importance of software and systems in the desktop. Uh, and they really became the dominant player then in the, from the 80s to the 90s. Bill Gates became the richest man in the world. Uh, but it was based around the, the importance of software. 
Uh, and if you were to suggest in the 1990s that the dominance of Microsoft, you know, the, where would the dominance, where would the threat to Microsoft come? You certainly wouldn't have put your bet on a, a teenager in his bedroom in Finland as being something that would disrupt the uh, marketplace. But this is a young Linus Torvalds. So Linux became a huge disruptor to the marketplace and the dominance of Microsoft. And that wasn't predictable. Uh, it was a real surprise. So uh, this is his email. I think this is a really important document in the history of technology, I think. But it's about 68 words, I think. Uh, and it's, it could only have happened in the, um, in the age of the internet, where you could globally ask, post a request, and ask for help. So he says in here that this won't be big and professional. He didn't expect Linux, the operating system, to be big and professional. I think he was wrong there. Uh, it is the largest collaborative project in the history of mankind. So over a million people have contributed within 10 years. Uh, so really important, really successful. Uh, and I was interested from the outset. I had been in the software industry for about 15 years at this stage, uh, more. And we knew that developing software, uh, when software was first, the term software was first used in its current form in the late 1950s, 1958 was the first uh, recorded instance. And then by 1968, people were talking about a software crisis. That it was really difficult to develop good software, high quality software, on time and within budget. So it was known that this was really difficult to do. You could do it, you could pick two out of three. But uh, in software, open source software is promising that you could get high quality software, you could get it quickly, and apparently for free. Uh, and free doesn't always mean zero cost, as I'll talk about later. But this was a real paradox. So to me, I was really interested. How could we've tried for 30 years in, in research to come up with methods to allow us to develop software of high quality and quickly and as cheaply as possible. And we're not doing very well. Yet this community can do this uh, without any organizing principles that we're aware of. Uh, and initially, open source is very much about imitation, I would say. So if you wanted people to move from proprietary software like Microsoft Windows and Microsoft Office, then the, the, the products should be as similar as possible to make it as familiar as possible. So there were desktop equivalents and uh, office equivalents very quickly. But also, innovation started to happen pretty quickly. So in browser terms, the tab browser was something that came from open source software first. So innovation is inevitable when you've got a diverse community who are self-selecting to work on what they're best at. Uh, they quickly come up with very clever things. So we move very quickly from imitation to innovation. And this is a term in open source, category killers, which talks about open source software products that are so good there really isn't any need to develop an alternative. This will work fine. Uh, it's as good as anything else on the marketplace, or better in most cases. And here are some examples that Android has about a billion devices at present. Hadoop, OpenStack, Moodle, the LAMP stack, and Jarhead more recently are, are the tools that run the web. Uh, and very interestingly, if you look at this open source technology, it's also in these kinds of areas, mobile, big data, cloud, education, web. Those are really important technology sectors. The technology futurists, you'll hear a lot about this in the next 10 years, I would say. Technology futurists, IDC, talk about the third platform. So the first platform was mainframe computers, like the IBM mainframes uh, in the last 30 or 40 years. Then we moved to client server for about 20 years, where well, that was the paradigm. You had a client, thin client, and a, a server did all the processing in the background, and you had a, a, a small client on your web device or whatever to, to access that data. And the third platform is about the convergence of mobile, social media, big data, cloud, and web. And that's really where the technology is, uh, is going. And the very interesting thing is that open source technology is at the heart of this uh, transformation. The, um, we had a project, a New European Union project, a research project in 2004 to look at how we might broaden the use of open source software in European software industry. And this is a presentation from Philips that we, uh, at the time. So Philips are a major um, company, about 120,000 employees globally. And they did an analysis of when they should be using open source software. So the bottom left quadrant is where it's a waste 
to develop software internally, commodity software. So more and more software is in this space now. Uh, and if you're, use, if you're using resources to develop this kind of software, it's wasting time. On the other hand, there is this top quadrant this piece where you've got some really differentiating competitive edge technology. And if you're developing that in an open fashion, you may be losing some intellectual property. But in between, there's a, there's a huge area uh, that is growing to it makes more sense to use open source. So this was the, um, the model in Philips they'd moved to. Uh, we tried at the time, I think, to persuade the German car company, BMW, an automotive company, that they should look at open source software in the stack. And the suggestion at the time was that we should check into a, a, a mental hospital, that we are clearly mad to suggest that. Now, I think those companies are all using open source software somewhere in the stack. So just those ideas were too early, I think. But now it's very much part of the proposition for all kinds of reasons. Uh, and this was FUD. I'm going to talk about FUD later, fear, uncertainty, doubt. This is one of the original tactics to um, discourage open source software, discourage people from experimenting. So there's a myth propagated that open source software is just written by amateur hackers. It's given away for free, so there's no business opportunity, no way to make money on it. And it would stifle and kill a local software industry because this would, software would be developed elsewhere, would be brought in for free, and the local companies would have no a chance to make a profit or any business. And that's a myth. So this is FUD, really. The reality is that, uh, so Dirk Riele has done a study of this, uh, of where open source contributions happen around the world. And they happen during working hours, 9 to 5. So that doesn't suggest amateur hackers. The Linux kernel contributions from developers in over 500 companies. So we're really talking about a professional, uh, professional developer base given away for free with no business opportunity. Again, Red Hat are one example of a company with $2 billion in revenue per annum So in open source software. 90% of the Fortune 500 companies are using open source software. So there is clearly a business model around open source. And likewise, uh, the local software industry, it is, you can bootstrap. You don't have to develop all the software yourself. You can bootstrap on the availability of software developed elsewhere and customize it and offer services in the, in the region. And that one thing in Ireland, where I come from, uh, when uh, various uh, products were produced, the localization to the Irish language would take, no company would ever see that as a valuable or as a worthwhile endeavor. The market was too small. But by being open source, local uh, language speakers could, could adapt the software to, be, to produce a version in the Irish language. And that's the kind of thing that can happen everywhere. I think the local software industry can, can adapt uh, and can tailor to the particular context. And some of the advantages of open source software. Uh, for innovation, a really important um, prerequisite for innovation is requisite variety, that you've got different mindsets. So you get that automatically in open source communities because people from very different points of view come to look at the software and contribute to it. So it's very wide knowledge across a breadth of areas and also very deep knowledge. Within those areas, those people are experts. So you do get very high quality innovative software products through the open source process. As we've seen, I mentioned the ones in the third platform earlier. Uh, also, this is a, a slight paradox as well. You would expect if the source code is open, well, then it will be more vulnerable to security threats. And that, while that might be true, it's also it facilitates solving those security threats. So there are examples of uh, open security vulnerabilities that are discovered in software and open source software. They are discovered quickly. Uh, they're probably fixed in Australia, New Zealand. And then by the time people in Europe and the Middle East or people in the US wake up, the problem is solved. So it can be solved very quickly as well. So the transparency also gives you solutions for security. The no vendor lock-in is also, some of the earlier speakers mentioned this as well, that you, you, if you have the source code, if it's open data, open standards, then you can easily move to another supplier. And this is the bootstrap opportunity. Local software can, t they don't have to write all the software themselves. They can take the software, customize it, add services for a local industry, which is very uh, viable. Uh, and speaking earlier, the minister mentioned um, open data and open standards. They're the key, really, uh, and they go with open source software. But the real advantage is open data and open standards that you can build on, on top of that. Once that's in place, everything else falls into place in terms of leveraging this technology. 
Also, I think it's very important for recruiting. So everyone, this is a real challenge for technology companies now. You can't get the best people. Everyone wants the best people. They're hard to get. There's a real shortage of well-qualified people globally. Uh, but graduates will expect, they're used to using open source software at university. They will expect that. They will expect that kind of process, that kind of collaborated, collaborative atmosphere when they get to work. So we find that with some companies we're working with, that they use open, the open source process. They declare that to be the the development process within the organization to make it more attractive to recruit the best quality people uh, and that's a competitive edge. And the interesting thing I think is that I don't mention cost saving as the primary advantage of open source software. Undoubtedly there are cost savings. You can the total cost of ownership I think is clearly less, but it's it's not the main issue to me. The other ones are are more important, I think, rather than seeing it, seeing it as this is a low cost alternative to proprietary software. Of course you can make savings, but the other advantages are also extremely important in my view. Uh, I think also it's important to differentiate between the open source product and the open source process. So a lot, lot of focus early on was on the open source product, the software that was being developed like Linux and Apache, uh, MySQL, Perl, Python and so on. Uh, Whereas the open source process is probably equally important, this open collaborative model that allows us to produce software and produce uh, other things as well so quickly. And the open source process is really important. So I think it inspires, without open source, without a mode of working, well, the web would, wouldn't, wouldn't work without open source products, I guess. But even the, the process has been the inspiration for crowdsourcing, for inner source, for open data and standards, for citizen science and social coding. These are really important phenomena. Uh, and in all cases, open source was the proof of concept that this could work. People wouldn't have tried crowdsourcing, I think, if open source hadn't happened. There wouldn't have been a, a belief that you could get the incredible example. You, you know, some, some medical uh, crowdsourcing examples have led to phenomenal um, discoveries that would never have happened. Some of the intractable problems at NASA have been solved by a crowd, not by the experts at NASA, but by a crowd who look at it in a different way. So we're still... Um, haven't fully explored how, how the power of open will uh, change things. So some takeaways, I'm on the final slide, uh, some takeaways from this. So software is mostly a commodity now, and I think some of the speakers in the next two days are going to talk about this. Uh, so it's important then that if, you're, if it's commodity, you shouldn't be de wasting resources developing it from scratch. You should, you should be building on the commodity that's there to add value. Open source is still disrupting. So I've been involved in this for almost 20 years, and it, you know, people didn't expect it to disrupt as much as it did. Uh, it disrupted the whole software industry and beyond, and it's still disrupting. We're not sure where open will take us, but we're still on that disruptive journey, and long may it continue. I think this is really important. Do not underestimate FUD, fear, uncertainty, doubt, and the need for an open source lobby. So in Ireland, we, we did a lot of work in the, about 15 years ago. So we, we had really successful implementations of open source software within a hospital and within a, a government authority. Uh, and we thought we had done well. They were, they were really successful. We had moved people to this new technology. The proprietary software industry is really strong in Ireland, particularly multinationals. And the head of the one particular software multinational went to, visited the prime minister in Ireland and said, I think you, you should not be using open source software. This is really a bad move. You know, your economy depends on all this proprietary software and open source software is, is for hackers. Uh, we didn't have any lobby, so we couldn't, we weren't organized. We, you know, we were individuals without a lobby to organize effectively and to, to argue and rebut that kind of uh, statement. And that's why you need some kind of open source lobby. So uh, the um, proposal has been mentioned by several speakers, so Professor Hodge's uh, document on strategy, and also the FOSS Center of Excellence. That kind of initiative is a really excellent one because it provides that kind of, ensures as a lobby to counter and to educate people and to, uh, some kind of focal point to act. Uh, it's uh, act uh, as a counterbalance to any kind of negative publicity or, or, or suspicions that this may not work. So I think if we had something like that, we would have um, 
And, and, and in many countries have open source initiatives, they don't always work. So something like this, some kind of central lobby, I think is a good idea to keep a focus on, uh, on open source and ensuring that it can uh, flourish to the fullest extent. So that's my talk. I'm looking forward to talking again tomorrow and to enjoying the rest of the conference with you. And thank you again for the invitation to the conference. Thank you very much.